Okay, so here we are, continuing our way now through the sacrament life of the church after the creed and everything we believe. Now we talk about the sacraments and the ways in which we worship. And so tonight we'll be talking about baptism and confirmation. Uh, two of those sacraments that, that kind of have a connection, so it's a good overlap, it's a good combination to put those two sacraments together. Uh, but first, a quick overview, um, because we talk about the entire sacramental life of the church, and I think that actually when we went, when we talked about some of these things, I don't think I actually went through the seven sacraments. And it's good to situate ourselves to remind ourselves of what all seven sacraments um, are, because um, we're going to work through each of them. So if we were to ask about the seven sacraments, is that something that people know already, or is that, is that unfair to put you on the spot about that? So we have sacraments of initiation. Those get us into the life of the church. So that would be the first sacrament that we receive. So that would be baptism. And then also um, amongst the other sacraments that initiate us into the regular life of the church, so that when we go to mass, we're able to receive communion. So that would include the sacrament of the Eucharist. And then also the, uh, the other sacrament that also fully initiates us into the church that for a lot of our students they would receive in junior high, that would be confirmation. Okay, so we have baptism, Eucharist, confirmation. Then we have two sacraments of healing. So one would be to heal us of sins, and that's the sacrament of reconciliation or penance. Um, <clears throat> and then the other sacrament of healing is when people are, in fact, physically ill, when they, or just simply from old age, they might receive the sacrament of anointing of the sick. Okay, is that, you've heard of that as well. So anointing of the sick, that's another sacrament kind of classified under the sacraments of healing. And then after that, we have two more sacraments. Um, so after baptism, Eucharist, confirmation, um, confession or penance or reconciliation, those are all, those are all the same thing. Uh, anointing of the sick. Then we have sacraments that would indicate mission or um, in undertaking one's vocation in life, so responding to one's calling in life. So that might be, for this reason, man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two become one flesh. That would be the sacrament of matrimony or marriage. And then also the other sacrament by which one is then selected for ministry um, or is ordained, that would be orders, sacrament of orders or holy orders. So the um, religious life would be another vocation, but it's not a sacrament. So religious life is a commitment that is undertaken through the acceptance of vows, but it would not be a sacrament. So when we talk about the different vocations, you have marriage, which is a sacramental joining of a husband and wife, holy orders, the ordination of a priest, a deacon, or a bishop. Um, and then you also have consecrated life, which is a state of life. And, uh, but it is, it is not a sacrament, but does, does encompass vows. So, so that's kind of the seven sacraments. The, the catechism does spend a little time at the beginning, just before starting baptism, talking just briefly about all seven sacraments. And that's the structure that's given, is, is separating out sacraments of initiation, healing, and mission. That's, the, that's sort of the, the suggestion that's made there. It's not the only way that you can think about the sacraments or group them, but those are the seven sacraments in way, one way at least of grouping them or considering them. So now we'll talk specifically about baptism. So baptism, or the, this is the beginning of one's life in Christ, and it's done through the pouring of water. We think about baptizing people. The word baptize itself is, it comes from as a root word to mean to plunge or to immerse. So we get that sense of, of actually being submerged in water, and which is what we oftentimes associate with baptism. So literally, that's the origin of the term. But it really is the basis of our Christian life. It is the gateway into beginning our life in Christ. It is the first sacrament that people receive because the, it is, uh, one cannot receive any of the other sacraments until they first receive baptism. So that's, that's an important thing. We're, we're actually getting ready over in the school um, we were preparing some students who were going to make their first confession and for their first communion and it turns out we had a couple students who were um, not yet catholic but wanted to become catholic so we could prepare them and it turns out i found out in one case we had a student that wasn't baptized but the student made his first confession no he didn't <laughs> so okay not really because the, the until you're baptized you can't actually receive any of the other sacraments so then we sat down and explain to the family that actually baptism will forgive all sin, but you do have to be baptized before you make your first confession, first communion, all of those things. So it is the, so that gateway sacrament or the beginning of our life in Christ. 
Um, we do talk about the idea of it also being a sacrament of enlightenment. Baptism is, is it also accompanies enlightenment because it does involve catechetical instruction. We are actually learning the faith. Baptism is, isn't just something that you mechanically go through as if it's like waving a magic wand and then just suddenly you know, this, this, is, this is all that's involved. We pour a little water, we say the magic words, and then everything is done. No, we want, in addition to receiving the sacrament of baptism, we want people, in fact, to be catechized into the significance of this moment. So we want them to know and to be enlightened about what it is that they're entering into, about this relationship they, they have with Jesus Christ. So when the fathers of the church talk about baptism, sometimes they would use terms about enlightenment, about being enlightened, being anointed. Baptism is sometimes described as an anointing, and we do have anointing that takes place as part of the ritual, and I'll describe that in a moment. Um, it is a gift. It is a, it is a free gift. And this actually is really a remarkable thing to not underestimate, is that the uh, baptism is not something that we in any way merit or deserve or earn. We enter into baptism uh, clothed with original sin, and so really not deserving God's mercy. And it's a free act of grace. As a pure act of love, we can say that God gives us through that sacrament, sanctifying grace, gives us new life in Christ. And this is something God wishes to do, but it is important to realize that um, so we don't, we don't merit it or deserve it or earn it. It is in fact a free gift. It is a grace that is given to us. It is a clothing. We are clothed with Christ. And we'll even talk about of using white garments to symbolize that, that clothing as well. And sometimes it's also referred to as a bath, so to be bathed. And this is something that uh, is also used. This, these are some images that we'll, we'll end up um, speaking about a little bit as we go through the sacrament. So the, uh, the signs of the sacrament, especially in Old Testament times, we can trace back to a few images in the Old Testament that actually are very helpful to give us a little bit of an image of what we're expecting in baptism. And oddly enough, each of these images is always going to have some element of the Holy Spirit connected to it because um, throughout the history of the church, baptism and the reception of the Holy Spirit or the descent of the Holy Spirit is something that is very closely connected. And in the Acts of the Apostles, for example, um, when people are, they come to believe in Jesus. So the apostles preach Christ and they say, they, they talk about this gift of salvation. When they come to believe, so they first hear the preaching, they accept it. So they're accepting that, that message of the gospel and they believe in it. And then oftentimes as a sign of their faith, they say, well, then what is to prevent me to be baptized? Um, so then oftentimes they're baptized. We think about the jailer um, who... Um, when St. Paul was, was proclaiming the gospel to the, to the jailer that had them in prison, or there's also the, the story in the Acts of the Apostles of the Ethiopian eunuch who, was, who Philip met. Um, he was reading the scriptures he didn't understand. Philip met him and explained who Jesus Christ was. Very first desire that they would have would be to be baptized, and then having been baptized, they received the gift of the Holy Spirit, that a lot of times the Holy Spirit comes upon them in a particular way. And so the Acts of the Apostles shows this intimate connection between instruction, catechetical instruction, belief, coming to faith, the reception of the actual sacrament of baptism by the pouring of water, and then also the gift of the Holy Spirit. And these things are all very much connected with one another. So when we look at Old Testament images of some of these things, and we look especially for signs of water, we can actually go back to the first chapter of Genesis and to the idea of creation itself. It is that the very opening part of Genesis talks about when the earth itself was a formless waste, the spirit of God hovered over the waters and then out of the chaos of the waters actually can't, comes forth creation. And this is part of the imagery used in Genesis chapter one. It's interesting that we have both the mention of water so the, and then also the, the spirit, the spirit of, of the Lord hovering over the waters, bringing forth new life. And that's actually what happens in baptism. So new life comes from receiving the Holy Spirit and through the pouring of waters of baptism. Then also we can think about the uh, Noah and the flood. There's another mention of water. What happened at that time is that the Lord sent forth the, the water in the form of the flood to wash away sinful humanity. 
Now, it's a little devastating, okay? <laughs> pretty serious, pretty extreme example there to, to wash away all of humanity, but it was also mentioned that this was humanity that been, had been corrupted by sin, and so Noah was to be preserved upon the waters in the ark. But then what was the sign of the Holy Spirit that was present there? Can anyone think of anything connected with Noah and the ark that might be a sign of the Holy Spirit? Perhaps an animal. Perhaps an animal that, that sometimes is depicted as, as indicating the presence of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps an animal that would come forth to the ark and that Noah would send out of the ark and that might return perhaps carrying an olive branch, which is the, um, the scriptural sign of the, the predestination of the United Nations. No, I'm just kidding when I say that. <laughs> the olive branch, and the, okay, and that's the dove, okay, so that, so you, the dove itself, because remember that the dove appears once again hovering over Jesus when he was baptized, so the Holy Spirit descends in the form of a dove. So there you have the washing away of sinful humanity with the use of water, but we also see the presence of the Holy Spirit giving a sign of hope, bringing that, that sign, uh, the olive branch, the sign of hope, and the sign effect that Noah, in fact, would be saved and that they would come once again to dry land. Um, and so water was a powerful instrument for the cleansing of sinful humanity, for the restoration of humanity, which was then reborn through Noah and through his line, it's according to the, the tradition from that, that uh, or those early chapters of Genesis. Then if we were to go forward from there and we were going to look for more signs of water, the next sort of major sign that uh, in, in, in the actual sacrament of baptism, when we bless the water, all these things are mentioned. So the prayers that we use, they mention these various things about the waters of creation, the waters of the flood. The next one after that come the waters of the Red Sea. And you remember Noah, or remember Moses, remember Moses crossing through the Red Sea. And if I could sing in, in some particular way, I might, I, I'd have to hum the theme from the Ten Commandments and the dramatic scene of, of Noah stretching out his hands so that way the waters would then, in fact, be pulled back. So that way the Israelites could cross through the Red Sea, crossing on dry land with the waters like a wall on their right and on their left, them passing through the midst of the sea. And so it's a, a remarkable moment in which passing through the waters, they actually pass from slavery into freedom slavery from the Egyptians, then passing into the freeborn, being, becoming freeborn children of Israel. But when we talk about the sign of baptism, we talk about entering into baptism and passing through the waters, starting as slavery in slavery, but slavery to sin, and then passing through the waters and now emerging this time as freeborn children of God. Not just the sons of Israel, but now sons and daughters of God. And so there's a, a kind of a parallelism there, which is very good. And where might be a sign of the Holy Spirit? This is a, it's not a trick question, but it is kind of a, sort of a hard one to maybe grasp onto immediately. Is that when we think about how it was that they came to the Red Sea, is there any sign of the Spirit that would have been present there? Anything that would have led them forth and protected them and, and been their guide? Is that, do you, I don't know if you remember this depiction, but when, uh, when they were following the Moses and following that path and then being guided through the desert. Do you remember that they were following the, the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud? There was, the, there was the cloud that was present and then the pillar of fire that was there by night. And there actually, I think, is another, again, once again, a little sign of the Holy Spirit. So there's always this connection between the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the use of water for purification or for freedom to, be, to being set free. And then, of course, when we go into the gospel itself, now we start to talk about Jesus Christ himself and baptism. And of course, one of the first things that we might think of in terms of baptism is we would say, well, Christ himself was baptized. Remember what happened with John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was baptizing in the River Jordan. He was calling people to repentance. This is the perfect time to talk about that during Advent because we hear about the call of John the Baptist calling us to repent. So Jesus repented of his sins, right? and went down into the River Jordan to be baptized? No. <laughs> okay. Remember how John the Baptist even protested. He says, this isn't right. He says, I should be the one to be baptized by you, not I shouldn't be the one baptizing you. But Jesus says, let it be this way. And this is actually really a sign of Jesus's humility, but I think also his really taking on a full share of our human nature in all things but sin. We know that Jesus was sinless. He himself did not need to receive 
any forgiveness of sin through baptism, but rather by humbling himself and by going through everything that we share in in our human nature, he has united himself to us and, there, and thereby in receiving baptism, in the, in the pouring of those waters, we can say he consecrate the waters by which we ourselves then are baptized. And so it's by his full sharing in our humanity that then by um, subjecting that humanity to baptism, he has opened the door for baptism for us, which is an efficacious sacrament for the forgiveness of our sins. And so it's really a remarkable gift not that Jesus received anything per se from his baptism, we're the ones who benefited from the fact that he was baptized. So those waters were made holy, and we find the origins of the sacrament by which we can experience salvation in his subjection to that baptism by John the Baptist. But there's also another thing to be said for that, because remember I said baptism was also a gateway sacrament, it's the beginning of our life of faith. Well, think about what that was for Jesus. What was that the beginning of? when Jesus was baptized. It was the very start of his actual public ministry. So is the, yeah, when we talk about Jesus' the three years of his public ministry, so we the Gospels all point, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke all point back to, so Jesus starting his public ministry, which there were two events that, um, that, that marked this. One was his fasting in the desert, so he went out into the desert where he experienced the temptation in the desert and then also his baptism. And that's present in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We get all um, in each of those Gospels. We are pointed to those as, as um, essential elements. It really begins his public mission. So he had already begun his life on earth. And that hidden life in Nazareth then transitioned into his public life, and baptism was the beginning, you might say, of that public mission or that public ministry that is there. Just as we start the beginning of our life of faith in Christ from the moment of our baptism. And we can say that that then continued forward, Jesus' mission then to proclaim the kingdom and to bring salvation through his death and resurrection. And then what was one of the very last things that Jesus said to the apostles before he ascended into heaven? This is a famous line that comes in Matthew's gospel. He gathers the disciples together. He says, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me. And so then he gives them a great commission. He says, then go forth and baptize, go forth and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Christ's public ministry opens with baptism, his baptism, and it concludes with baptism, the commission of the disciples to go out and baptize. So that underscores really the, the fundamental centrality of baptism, just how critical baptism is in our life of faith. But even more than that, we can also look to certain moments in Christ's life itself, even in the midst of his, in his mission, especially around his crucifixion, in which baptism is also mentioned. Remember that Jesus talked about the fact that he would have to go through his passion. He would tell the disciples, the Son of Man is going to be then mocked by the chief priests and scribes and, and um, scourged and uh, crucified and put to death, but on the third day he would rise. And when we have James and John, there's a famous scene in which James and John are, are asking Jesus for a special favor. They're saying, oh, well, give us this privilege. Let us, to sit, let us sit at your right and at your left when you come in glory. And Jesus doesn't tell them no, but he doesn't exactly tell them yes either. He puts a question to them. He says, can you endure the same baptism with which I will be baptized? Um, can you drink from the same chalice from which I shall drink? And all of this is a veiled reference to his own passion. So when Jesus talks about drinking from the cup, he says, you know, the, uh, would that this cup could pass me by, but not according to my will, but, but thy will. And Jesus was referring to that the night of the agony of the garden. Uh, he was referring to his own passion. So the idea of drinking from the cup, meaning to share in the passion of Christ, the idea of enduring a baptism, being baptized with Christ as an actual sign of his passion. So we can actually refer to Christ's uh, passion itself as, as a baptism, a baptism by fire, you might say, or maybe to use that image of a trial that is there. But he even uses the term baptism to speak of that. Because one of the things that we say about baptism, so, so Jesus died on the cross and we refer to that as a baptism. 
St. Paul uses a wonderful image in Romans chapter 6. It's a, fa it's a fascinating passage. It's, um, we read it at Easter time. In fact, it will come up in the Easter Vigil itself. It will be one of the readings in the Easter Vigil. He says, Do you not know that when you were baptized, you were baptized into Christ's death? And then having died with Christ, then you will also share in his resurrection. And the reason why we talk about baptism as a kind of death, as a kind of dying, is because baptism is a moment for us to leave behind the old man and to be reborn in Christ. It is a death. We are, we are dying to self. We are dying to sin. We are dying to the old man so as to be reborn in him. So baptism in some ways actually is a death, and it's fittingly described that when Jesus would talk about his own death, that he would refer to that as a kind of a passage, a, a rite of trial, a baptism, um, and a baptism in which there on the cross, his heart would be pierced and blood and water would flow forth. And the church oftentimes holds up that scene of Jesus with the blood and water coming from the side of Christ, um, dem demonstrating not only the blood, the sign of the Eucharist, the body and blood of Christ that nourishes us, but the water, blood and water, the water that comes forth from the side of Christ that washes us. And so we are actually washed clean by the power of the act of redemption that occurred in Jesus' death, in his passion. So that's how uh, salvation was won for us. So, so we might even kind of look at all of these different things, this really connections in Christ's life to baptism. From the beginning of his public ministry at the River Jordan with John the Baptist, at the very end of his ministry when he commissions the disciples to baptize and even in the middle there as Jesus goes to the cross itself which he refers to as a kind of baptism a kind of death and so that really it, it underscores some of the remarkable things that uh, become a part of baptism and so then later on in the Acts of the Apostles so for example when Peter goes out and preaches his first great homily on Pentecost Sunday. He, it's on Pentecost that Peter then proclaims Jesus Christ, and it's this fabulous moment of courage, which the timid disciples then suddenly are filled with great courage, and they talk about the need for, for uh, those who had crucified Christ or those who had uh, led to his death to convert, repent, and be baptized. And that's what he calls them to do. And the scriptures say, I forget what the number is. He says, then they say some 3,000 were baptized that day or some 5,000. I don't know, I forget the number. It's a, 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 very, a large number of people were baptized that day. Peter calls them to repent. And that is one of the things that we talk about in dying to sin, in repenting. So baptism is a sign of repentance. Um, people went out into the River Jordan because John the Baptist was calling them to a baptism of repentance. And so baptism is in fact a time for us to repent. So we turn away from sin. And uh, for those who have already been baptized, we will renew your baptismal promises. And it's a time for us to say, yes, I am still committed. I renew my commitment. I reject Satan and all his empty promises and all his empty show. Um, so the uh, uh, Satan and all his works and all his empty show. Um, we reject those things. We, we turn our back on them. And that is a renewal of the commitment that we made in baptism. Um, so those are some wonderful scriptural um, comments that we could make uh, uh, about baptism itself from the imagery in the Old Testament up through the actual mentions of baptism in the Gospels and in the Acts of the Apostles. The, the pattern then for baptism itself, and we can say that this is something that, that draws from what I've already talked about in its scriptural roots, but it's also something that was present in the early church, is that baptism would occur through the preaching of the word so the, the, the gospel would be proclaimed. People would accept the gospel, so, and then they would make a profession of faith. So professing their faith, then they would receive the sacrament of baptism. And then also, again, there's always that connection with the Holy Spirit. So remember, though, that it's the preaching of the word or their catechesis so that they are, are trained in the faith. That's part of what we're doing here. We're talking about catechesis for people who are coming to the church, who are coming to baptism. Um, or for those who are baptized who are coming to the entrance of the church and entering into the church. Um, and so it's good for us to have time for preaching and catechesis, to accept the gospel, to make a profession of faith before baptism or before the profession of faith. Here's the one challenge to that, though. What about infants? Because so often when we talk about baptism, aren't we talking about little children? So for infants, there's no time there's no point in actually spending a long time catechesis uh, in catechesis so 
I could take a, the one month old and I could say, now remember, okay, now let's practice making the sign of the cross. <laughs> and we take the little child and, you know, and it's, that, obviously that doesn't, that's not gonna make any sense. So infants aren't able to go through any catechesis prior to their baptism. So when we talk about infants or when we're talking about young children, their catechesis has to be post-baptism. Whereas for adults or for those who are old enough to understand, we want their catechesis to be pre-baptism. So that's kind of the custom. It's almost sort of a two-track system that it developed from some of the early days in the church. If you're old enough to understand, then that's why we're doing these classes. This is your pre-baptismal catechesis for those who are not baptized. So we want that catechesis to take place beforehand, but for infants, it will have to take place afterwards, which is why when for the baptism of infants, we impress upon the parents, we say, do you accept this responsibility, the responsibility of training your children in the practice of the faith? And so it's an important part for infants because the parents are then accepting a, an important responsibility. Mm -hmm. For the rite itself, um, so let's talk a little bit about what happens in the ritual of baptism. And this is going to be true for the baptism of infants, which you might see. We had a baptism on Sunday at 10 o'clock. So uh, if you were there for that, you might have actually seen a baptism. I don't know, has anyone seen a Catholic baptism recently? It's been a while since you've seen one. Okay, so let me just kind of go through the rite. But this is not necessarily that different from what we would do also for our CIA or what we would do at the Easter Vigil. So one of the first things we do in the ritual is we cross the child. So the, the cross is traced on the forehead of the child to be baptized. And there are also moments, and this would be done actually in some of the scrutinies that would take place in your acceptance into the catechumenate, there's also a moment of of tracing the cross, of being anointed with the oil of salvation, or tracing the cross on one's forehead. It's a sign, it's a, it's a sign that we are marked by the cross of Christ. In the same way that we would make the sign of the cross and we would impress the cross on ourselves. Um, so that is a symbolic recognition that we belong to Jesus because that the sign of the cross has been impressed upon us. Another thing that's important in baptism is to proclaim the word of God. So it's always good to bring scripture into any of the celebration of the sacraments. So that's done through a brief re reading of scripture. If it's an infant baptism at the Easter vigil, we will have scripture. We'll have a lot of scripture actually. So you'd say we get extra readings at the Easter vigil. So always good to have the word of God. Another thing that happens is a prayer of exorcism, which that sounds very dramatic because people think of a horror movie from the 1970s. Um, but when we say exorcism, to, uh, exorcism is every time there's a prayer of blessing, we would actually call that a minor exorcism, meaning anytime you want to bless an object, it's we're casting out any evil influence because we want the object itself to be blessed. And so the idea of casting out the power of sin, there's a prayer which technically is called a prayer of exorcism, a minor exorcism, but there is a prayer that is said for the, the infant children. And uh, for an infant baptism, that would be the moment at which then symbolically over the heart, they receive the oil of salvation. So they're anointed with one of the holy oils that we use in the, in the sacrament of baptism um, in connection with that exorcism. And then after that, we have the blessing of the water. And at the Easter Vigil, we will do that as well. So we'll bless the water, that we, which we will use for baptism. The Easter Vigil will actually even bring over the Easter candle. And the Easter candle itself will be submerged in the water, which is another sign of, of the grace of Christ entering into, literally entering into the water. So as the candle itself is submerged into the water um, as a sign of the way in which Christ blesses that water. And then we have the moment of baptism itself, the pouring of water um, with the recitation of the formula, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So the pouring of water with that ritual, that's the actual moment of baptism proper. And of course, we'll do that at the Easter Vigil as well. Um, after that, then there's the anointing with chrism, which shows that we receive the uh, royal dignity of Christ as priest, prophet, and king. And so there we use the sacred chrism. That's another one of the holy oils, and that's given on the crown of the head for infants. Um, when it comes to the Easter Vigil, we will use the chrism, but this will be actually given on the forehead in the Sacrament of Confirmation, which we're going to talk about before we finish tonight. So, the, so one way or another, the, the oil of chrism is applied. And then I mentioned the idea of being uh, washed clean and having white garments as a, as a symbol of baptismal purity, of being clothed in Christ. 
So the idea of clothing. So then there's the idea of clothing people in a white garment. The placing of a white garment as a sign, as an outward sign of the, uh, of the inward grace that's been given, that sanctifying grace that's been given in the sacrament. And they're given a candle, a baptismal candle, that's lit from the Easter candle. Because remember, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. And so we then carry that, that light of that baptismal candle, a light that is to be kept uh, burning brightly. So we might be faithful witnesses to Christ. Uh, if the person is old enough to receive communion, and this, is, this will happen at the Easter Vigil, those who are baptized and confirmed then will also make their communion um, at that same time. Uh, but then receiving communion, that also completes their initiation into the church. Um, so I mentioned a moment ago about the different oils, and baptism is also a kind of anointing, uh, being anointed by God. And so I should say a little something briefly about the different oils. Um, up in the sanctuary itself, and I was going to mention this in the church tour, but I had too much to talk about and I forgot to, to mention it. But there's a little niche in the side wall, and there's a glass door, and we actually keep the different holy oils present there. And these are oils that are blessed or consecrated by the bishop every year. There's a, a gathering we have, a chrism mass, where the bishop blesses the new oils and they're distributed to all the different parishes so that way we have these oils. So it's a connection then that we have with the bishop. And so it's essentially an olive oil. That's the base, basically what all the oils are. Um, one of them is the oil of salvation. That's the one that's given symbolically over the heart um, or that can be given at the entrance into the catechumenate. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a, a blessed oil. There's another one that is the oil of the sick. That's the one that we would use. We won't use that at the Easter Vigil unless we have to call an ambulance because someone's dropped over or something like that. <laughs> no. they, that's the one where when someone actually is very ill for going into the hospital or the nursing homes, we might use the oil of the infirm or the oil of the sick to administer the sacrament of anointing, and that would be for physical and for spiritual healing. But then there's a third oil, and this one is consecrated. This is one that's not just olive oil, but olive oil into which the bishop then adds a perfumed balsam. It's actually a very... Um, fragrant uh, balsam and aromatic that is added to the oil and then it itself is consecrated and that is actually the special oil that we use for baptizing children they receive it on the crown of the head for confirming uh, young uh, young adults and and, uh, and adults so as they receive that on their forehead it is the sacred chrism that is applied to the hands of the priests at their ordination to consecrate the hands of the priests and it's also the um, perfumed oil, the sacred oil that is poured on the head of the bishop when the bishop is ordained. So if the ordaining bishop wants to torture the baby bishop who is just being ordained, you can pour too much on and then, and then it will be, as the psalm says, oil running down Aaron's beard. It's a, it's a, there's, a, there's a psalm that mentions the idea of the, the oil coming down, the, coming down upon the garments. If too much oil is applied. But that's, that's the sacred chrism. And sometimes when people, when we use that at confirmation or baptisms, you can even kind of tell, you can smell the, the, the perfumed oil. So it's, a, so it's an, an exquisite oil really as a sign of the presence of the Holy Spirit. So those are some of the different oils that are used. Um, baptism itself can be received only one time. The, uh, the, the good news about baptism is it forgives all sin. The bad news is you can only receive it one time. <laughs> Would that you could just be baptized as many times as you wanted and your sins could just be forgiven again and again. No, so they, but the, the, the complete get out of jail free card, the total um, gift of the remission of all sin comes once through baptism. Um, forgives all sin. It forgives not only original sin, the sin that we inherited from our first parents, Adam and Eve, but also any actual sin, any personal sin that anyone has committed is all of that is forgiven and remitted in baptism. Uh, baptism uh, strengthens the gift of faith. So as we come to faith, so faith leads us to request baptism, but baptism also strengthens the gift of faith and helps us to grow in that faith as well. Um, the people who can perform baptism, the ordinary ministers of baptism would be any cleric. So that would be a deacon, a priest, or a bishop. Um, but if it is a situation of an emergency, if it is a true emergency, and there is someone who has not been baptized, anyone, any lay person, can and should baptize in an emergency by pouring water and by saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That is a valid baptism. Um, 
but ordinarily we would not recommend people to do that, but in extraordinary circumstances, it is appropriate to do that. Um, the Catechism talks about baptism by water, which is the normal sacramental way of administering baptism, but there's also two other ways in which baptism is conferred theologically. So theologically, we would talk about baptism by water, but we'd also talk about baptism by blood and baptism by desire. This is a very brief part of the Catechism, but it's just worth at least mentioning that baptism by blood would be those who are martyred for the faith, that if a person has not yet received baptism but dies for the faith, that is equivalent to being baptized because through the shedding of their blood, they in fact would receive all the effects of baptism having given their life for Christ. So, um, so for the martyrs, baptism by blood is, in, is, is considered also uh, a way of being baptized. And then the baptism of desire, this would be the idea of someone who wishes to receive the fruits of the sacrament but either doesn't know Christ or, but if they did, they would want to receive them. And so this notion that out of the desire of the heart to, to follow God, to do what is right, um, that uh, so especially for people who've never heard of Christ or who never had the opportunity to receive the sacraments, can they in fact be saved? The church would say yes, the possibility is held out for them through baptism of desire. The thing is, when we talk about baptism, the, the, by using baptism of water, that is the sure method, meaning we can, we can show through the external manifestation of that rite that you have, in fact, received the sacrament of baptism. These other two, baptism by blood and by desire, are not, they're, they're not, certainly baptism by desire is harder to pin down. So it's, that's why we like to go through the objective um, administration of the sacrament by which we know that the fruits of the sacrament have been bestowed and received. So we certainly show a preference for the baptism by water, but those other two forms of baptism are, do exist as, um, as at least a refuge in particular um, when baptism by water either hasn't been or cannot uh, be received. So anyway, that's just a quick aside on that, um, on what's kind of a complicated thing. Um, some other aspects of the consequence of baptism, the fruits that come from baptism, not only forgiving sin, we are remade as a new creation. So baptism makes us into a new creation in Christ. We become a member of Christ's body. So we, we are grafted onto the vine to use John's gospel for that. So we become a member of his body. We receive the Holy Spirit and that makes of our bodies itself a temple of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is given to us and that is a temple in which we are to, to keep that temple holy and sacred um, so the Holy Spirit might continue to abide within us. We can call God our Father. We receive a sense of adoption. So we become adoptive children of God. Jesus is the Son of God by right. We become adoptive sons of God, sons and daughters of God by grace. Um, and that, that gift of being adopted by the Father and receiving that grace enables us to believe in God, to hope in him, and to love him. Gives us the power to act in response to the Holy Spirit, to respond to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and to grow in the virtues. So baptism is something that actually nourishes and enables the internal spiritual life. It actually feeds us in all these ways. And so sometimes the hard part is that it's hard to kind of pin that down to say like, so after someone's baptized, we can say, well, do you feel any different? To some extent, you might say, well, I don't really feel different, but there has been real grace conferred. And even if we can't always pin it down or, or feel it or identify its effects in an objective way, it has, in fact, produced these effects with, within us. Uh, it makes us a member of the church. So we enter into the church through baptism. Uh, it makes us into living stones in that temple uh, for the Lord. We have a share, actually, in Christ's priesthood, that we have a share in, in Christ who is priest, prophet, and king, so we share also in his dignity as well, in those, in those responsibilities. Baptism itself becomes a bond of unity be between Christians, because although when it comes to different Christian religions, um, there is disagreement about different um, details of the faith, but one of the common themes for most Christians, not, not all, unfortunately, but for most Christians would be agreement at least on the sacrament of baptism. So many, um, many other Protestant Christians still practice and observe baptism as according to the divine command. And we always, of course, want to make sure that the baptism is conferred 
in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In some cases, um, I think, I think that the more that Christianity becomes fragmented and the more sometimes Christianity sometimes moves almost in a Unitarian direction, sometimes baptism kind of gets lost or gets confused even there. But for the most part, baptism is one of those common threads that we might say binds together Catholics and many uh, Christians as well. So it does actually uh, demonstrate a sign of unity among, among Christians. Um, it confers an indelible mark. So we are marked by Christ from the moment of our baptism. That is a mark that cannot be repeated and it also cannot be taken away. Every once in a while, someone says, I'd like to be unbaptized. No, sorry. <laughs> I, want, I want you to take my name out of the baptismal register. Actually, we don't do that, so that's it. So once it's received, it is in fact a permanent thing, and so we've been marked by, by Christ uh, forever with that. Um, so then what I'd like to do from here is then move on to confirmation. Um, so that's a, that confirmation actually is a little shorter than the section on baptism, so that's it. And anything just with baptism, just as we stand right now? Everyone looks happy, okay, that's it. Um, or you're content. So, um, so confirmation. Confirmation is another one of the sacraments of initiation. And when we talk about confirmation, this is very closely connected to baptism. It's very fitting that we put these together because we would say of confirmation that that is a gift of the Holy Spirit that completes the work that is begun in baptism. So we receive the Holy Spirit in baptism, but we also then we can say that those graces that are given to us in baptism are perfected in confirmation. So confirmation and baptism are very closely united. Um, in, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the custom in the Eastern Catholic Church, the Eastern Rites of the Catholic Church, and the Western Rites. In the Eastern Rites, they actually physically unite confirmation and baptism. They're, they're conferred even on the same day in the same ceremony. But we would still, even in the Latin Church, where confirmation is given oftentimes um, in junior high school or many years later, so baptism and confirmation are separated in time, but there still is a great connection between baptism and confirmation. The gifts given in baptism brought to perfection in confirmation. So where do we find the signs of confirmation in the scriptures? Well, one of the things that we can see about the gifts of the Holy Spirit is that in the Old Testament, there are many times in which the Holy Spirit is poured out upon specific people. Um, sometimes there'd be mention of the Spirit coming upon the various judges mentioned in the Old Testament, on the various kings mentioned in the Old Testament, but probably in a particular way, the Spirit of the Lord rests upon the prophets. The prophets are probably one of the um, Old Testament signs of really seeing the Holy Spirit really active and involved in the life of some Old Testament figures. The prophets, we could all say, were inspired by the Spirit of God. So the Holy Spirit rests upon the prophets, and so it guides their preaching and their prophetic action. But we also say that the Holy Spirit was received or that descended upon Jesus Christ. We said that already in his baptism. Remember when he was baptized, the Spirit descended out of heaven. And you heard the voice of the Father, this is my beloved Son, listen to him. Um, and, uh, and so there's already a connection between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the moment of his baptism and that gift of the Holy Spirit. But there's also, we can say, the, the principal sign of the gift of the Holy Spirit and the sign of the sacrament of confirmation comes after Jesus is ascended, and it comes on the day of Pentecost. So Jesus ascends 40 days after Easter, and on 50 days after Easter, when the Feast of Pentecost itself was celebrated, the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and the apostles, and this really is the prime example of confirmation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The apostles gather on that day in the upper room. The doors are locked for fear of the Jews. They said, we're told oftentimes that they gathered in fear. And so even though they knew Jesus had risen from the dead, they still were not yet um, filled with the, with the courage and zeal. They needed the gift of the Holy Spirit to fan into flame the courage that they should have in order to witness to Christ. And so that happens to them. Um, on the day of Pentecost, and Christ even said that it would. He says, I'm going away from you. This is in John's Gospel uh, in the, is during the Last Supper. He says, I'm going away from you, and it is better for you that I go, because if I go, then I will send the Advocate to you. And he uses that phrase, the Advocate, meaning the Holy Spirit. 
Um, and he will remind you of everything that I said. And so the, the gift of the Holy Spirit is actually really an essential aspect of Christ's mission. In other words, not only did he come to proclaim the gospel, to suffer and die for us, to accomplish our, our salvation through his death and resurrection, but then to bring it truly to completion, the Holy Spirit then also had to come in order to complete that work and to invigorate the apostles as they would then continue to, to bear witness to Jesus Christ. There may be a couple other things, uh, at least one or two other times when we could talk about the Holy Spirit. Um, remember when, today's the Immaculate Conception, so we're, we're, we're gathering here on December 8th, um, but remember that the um, angel Gabriel told Mary that she would conceive by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would overshadow her. The power of the Most High would come upon her. So the Holy Spirit is actually also effective even before the day of Pentecost, many, many years before that, is effective in bringing Christ into incarnate into the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So I said the Holy Spirit is also, that's very important for bringing Christ to us and into the world. Um, so the Holy Spirit in a particular way did that in a singular, with a singular grace given to the Blessed Virgin Mary. But remember that every time we celebrate Mass and we're preparing to consecrate the bread and wine on the altar, we're always calling down the Holy Spirit because just as the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and brought Christ into her womb, that Christ was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, so it's also calling upon the Holy Spirit that bread and wine can be changed into the body and blood of Christ. So there's a very important role that the Holy Spirit plays in bringing Christ into uh, the lives, uh, into our lives, into the lives of the Blessed Mother, and into the apostles, filling them with courage and zeal. Um, and so we see that tremendous courage of the apostles, and the apostles themselves, then as they would go out and evangelize, they would impose hands. And this is one of the critical things about, um, they, they would say for confirmation, is the imposition of hands. So they place hands on people, and is in, in place in, laying, in the laying on of hands and invoking the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit would come upon um, the different people as they would come to believe. So laying on of hands is an important sign that is part of the sacrament of confirmation. Um, it's also, we use chrism, um, so I mentioned that that sacred chrism, the perfumed oil, is placed on the forehead, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that's what's said in the sacrament of confirmation. And that's why sometimes this confirmation can also be called chrismation. Um, you have the placing of chrism or chrismation um, is another way of describing confirmation. And that sometimes is a term that they would use in the Eastern Catholic Church as they're talking about the chrismation uh, of people. So there, in the Eastern rites of the church, if you go to St. Charles, you go to the Maronite Catholic Church, for example, there they would baptize and confirm infants all in the same ceremony. So there, priests can confirm. In the Latin rite, we separate those and we wait for the bishop to, to come and confirm. So generally speaking, in the Latin rite, bishops are the ones who ordinarily confirm. And in the Latin rite, by exception, priests can confirm under certain circumstances, one of those being at the Easter Vigil. So the Easter Vigil, a priest can also confirm, and that, that's what happens at the Easter Vigil. So people who are baptized or received into the church will be confirmed this time by a priest. But if uh, in other circumstances, it would oftentimes normally be the bishop who would be the one to confirm. Um, to seal you with Christ, to seal you uh, with the sign of the Holy Spirit, um, um, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the idea of sealing or signing is the, like, the idea of like bearing the symbol or bearing the sign of Christ. In some ways, it's, it kind of has almost a military image of like you think about soldiers carrying a certain seal or an image or a shield that's emblazoned with a sign as their allegiance or their loyalty of to whom they belong. And so also with the Sacrament of Confirmation, we are sent out, you might say, as soldiers into the world. Soldiers for Christ, missionaries for Christ, bearing witness to him. And we carry the seal of Christ himself into the world to bear witness to him. Um, it is an important thing as we receive confirmation to renew our own baptismal promises. And this is something that you will hear us do at the Easter Vigil. We will ask you to re renew your baptismal promises, to reject Satan, to profess your belief in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then having renewed your baptismal promises and been sprinkled with the holy water that's blessed that night, again, a reminder of baptism. Then after that, there will, will come the moment of confirmation. So baptism and confirmation, very closely connected in our ritual, which you will see at the Easter Vigil. 
Um, one of the things that we also say, this is the one thing that the, the students are all afraid they're gonna be grilled on during, <laughs> during confirmation, is you will receive the seven gifts. Anyone know what the seven gifts are? The kids have to memorize them and then they forget them probably the day after they're confirmed. <laughs> As they say, oh, you have to know the seven gifts. So the seven gifts. So the seven gifts that we receive from the Holy Spirit, um, and these were gifts that are given out to all of us uh, in receiving the Holy Spirit. Because we talk about wisdom and understanding, knowledge, uh, the idea of courage or fortitude, uh, the idea of right judgment or counsel, um, the idea of reverence or piety. Sometimes they sometimes they go by a couple different names. And fear of the Lord. So the wisdom to be able to know to see things from God's perspective. The understanding, to be able to take in the faith and to, and to understand the mysteries of the faith. The knowledge, to be aware of the faith and what Jesus has taught us. The piety, in fact, to, to show reverence and, and piety before the Lord, so to be inspired by, to pious action. The idea of having a sense of right judgment or counsel, so to, to be counseled by the Most High, to be able to discern um, that which we should do to, to recognize what is that right path, to have the courage to do so. Um, so we need that strength or that zeal. Remember, it was the courage that made the weak apostles into bold proclaimers of the gospel. And also fear of the Lord, the idea of a, of a holy fear of the Lord, that we would fear to displease him, not servile fear, but a loving fear, because we know how much the Lord has loved us. So when we talk about the effects of confirmation, um, it does unite us more deeply with each of the persons of the Trinity, and it strengthens our bond, especially with the Holy Spirit, by being sealed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, by having those gifts given to us to help us to be more effective in our vocation. In fact, for people who are to be married, um, it is recommended, but not required. It is recommended that Catholics who marry be confirmed first. It is required that priests or deacons or priests who are to be ordained we must be confirmed and it's also required for those entering into religious life they must be confirmed before they make vows so confirmation is required as a prerequisite for religious life for ordination it is recommended strongly recommended for those that are approaching marriage it, give, it also gives an indelible mark we are marked um, so permanently uh, just as in baptism by the gift of the holy spirit given in confirmation it empowers us to be a witness to christ um, in to prepare for that it is in fact important for us to work on maturing in the faith we want to grow in our faith so that we, we are ready to accept the responsibilities of uh, becoming like an apostle uh, in the church and then we should also be in a state of grace when we receive confirmation the only other thing I might mention here is that for confirmation, people have a sponsor. Now, this is one of the things where when we were talking about people coming into the church, we, we, we started asking, and we will continue to ask about who your sponsor will be, who will stand up with you. And for baptism, we, taught, we call them oftentimes godparents. And for confirmation, we'll, we'll use the term sponsor. But we're really, in some ways, talking about the same function, which is that someone who has already been initiated stands up with you, you might say, as a fellow companion to walk alongside you on that journey and to assist you along the way. When it comes to infants, godparents, they never take the place of the parents, so the parents still have a, a, a fundamental and primary role, but godparents are there to provide assistance. So to be an example, to be a witness, um, to be a guide or a resource or a help, and it's just this notion that as we walk along that path, um, that we realize that we're not walking that alone, but that we have, you might say the sponsor is a concrete representation of the wider community that is also with you on this journey. So with you as you are taking the step, receiving these sacraments and entering the church. So there is the uh, critical things about confirmation. You know everything you need to know. Well, that's okay. Well, it's a, that's, it's a lot of material, but for baptism and confirmation, those are a lot of the critical things. Um, so we'll ask the Lord to help us to be ready to prepare for these sacraments. Um, and we look forward to conferring them at the Easter Vigil. Um, and so let us, especially today on the Immaculate Conception, we'll just ask for the intercession of, of the Mother of God. And we'll say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm.